We would like to take this opportunity to officially welcome you to today's session, Forecasting Disruption, How to Think About the Future in a Rapidly Changing World with Bill Burnett and Cynthia ben Benjamin. Now we'll turn it over to our presenters for introductions. Thanks, Annette, that's great. I'm happy to see everybody here. We're gonna have a really interesting conversation about the, uh, the future of you know, technology in this crazy, rapidly changing world. So um, we've got a, a couple of amazing, well, one amazing presenter and then just me. <laughs> let me. Let me introduce Cynthia Benjamin. She is the co-founder and chief strategy and innovation offer, officer of Together Senior Health, which is a digital healthcare company working in the um, Alzheimer's and dementia space. She's also been a lecturer at Stanford for a bunch of years um, has taught a couple of different programs, a fantastic class called ME 101 Visual Thinking, but currently a class ME 297 that is called Forecasting for Innovators. And she's going to be leading us through some forecasting uh, strategies uh, for this particular um, webinar. Thanks, Bill. Um, and let me introduce Bill Burnett. Um, Bill is uh, an adjunct professor in the de design group at Stanford. Um, he's actually been the executive director of the uh, the design impact program and the undergrad program for, gosh, a long time. Bill, you're going to have to remind me how many years. Uh, um, about 15. About 15 years. Um, and before that, uh, Bill had a distinguished career as a design leader, a designer and a design leader at Apple, at Counter Toys, at several startups, um, and so has a depth of experience in, in uh, design and design education. He's also a co-author of a book called Designing Your Life, which has uh, come out, came out of Stanford, but really resonated deeply um, across a wide swath of folks from people um, thinking about what they're going to do coming out of college to uh, what they might do in their encore career. Um, and then a second book, Designing Your New Work Life. Um, so Bill, ha really happy to, to share this webinar with you. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, in, in the Designing Your Life curriculum, we think about five-year futures, and that's actually what we're going to be talking about here. But we're going to be talking about it through the lens of design thinking and also technologies that are impacting our world today. So for those of you who've <laughs> probably heard of the phrase design thinking or maybe human-centered design is what we used to call it, um, we have uh, started the David Kelly, who started the D School at Stanford, our institute to teach design thinking basically to the world, said design thinking is all about unlocking potential and the creative confidence of our students. David's book, Creative Confidence, that he wrote with his brother, Tom Kelly, uh, was also a, a big hit. Um, and, you know, this idea of design thinking, although the D School started in 2006, our program in design goes back to the 60s, all the way, you know, back to even 1957 when we taught the very first class um, uh, in design. And it's always been a mixture of design, art, psychology, sociology. We like to think about designing and designers way of thinking as, as, a, as, as a powerful problem solving tool. It's a process. We say you don't start with a problem. You start with people. You start with empathy and really try to understand deeply what are the what are the issues that people are facing and what are the ways in which you might solve some of those problems. You know, we're gonna talk a lot about technology and technology futures today, but both Cynthia and I have shared the opinion that lots of startups, you know, start with a technology first and then go try to figure out who needs it. In the design thinking process, we would do the, exactly the opposite. First, we try to understand what's the real deep human need and not just the need that people describe when you talk to them, but what what's really going on past what they say and do to what they really think and feel. So we start with empathy, we redefine the problem, we come up with lots of ideas, because we know if we have lots of ideas, we'll have better choices. And then the whole idea of prototyping or designing little experiments to, to, to tweak the future and see what it's all about, prototyping and testing is the strategy for building our way forward. <laughs> so design thinking is kind of the undercurrent of everything we do in the design group at Stanford. It's a really, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a dynamic approach to problem solving because we use lots of, you know, techniques like brainstorming and mind mapping, and we'll talk about some of those today. But it's also using prototyping and, and rapid cycles of iteration and experimentation to figure out how to increase the innovation of outcomes. <clears throat> but more than that, it's a really great approach to problem finding 
And you know, I'm, I'm one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, the sort of business guru, you know, management professor, um, is um, there's there's nothing quite so foolish as doing something very very well that never needed to be done in the first place. And that describes a lot of the technology startups we see in Silicon Valley that start with some cool piece of technology and never find a need for it. So problem finding is where we think there's the highest leverage when we reframe problems based on human needs. And we use ethnography, empathic observations, and other techniques that we borrow from anthropology and sociology to truly understand <coughs> what users need and what's the best problem to solve. And because of that, we believe it's, been, it's, it's become a new perspective on value creation because when you can match a human-centered need to an actual technology and into a market that's, that's large and robust, you have you know, a really fantastic way of creating innovation and value creation. So today we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of forecasting in design thinking because you know, the needs and design principles that we use to create startups or new products or or new actions in the marketplace, these change over time. And certainly we're, we're in the period right now with things like AI, chat GPT, robotics, automation, where, where things are changing rapidly. And so the needs of, of people, consumers, organizations, uh, everybody, the needs are changing rapidly over time. And if we don't have some way of putting kind of a, a, a structure around this or at least a, a framework around how we think about the future <clears throat> we can we can really fall behind and so forecasting changes and tracking technology we think is really critical to any any design or innovation strategy and that's why for oh i don't know you and paul sappho have been teaching this class for over 15 years in the design group we really support the notion that we have to not just think about what do people need today but what's going to change as technology evolves in the next five, 10, even 50 years. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, and, and Cynthia, why, you know, you're the, you're the expert on this, on this subject. Why should innovators, um, you know, and people who might wanna to come to the workshop we're gonna be running in March, um, people who might be the CTO or the person in charge of the innovation organization at their company or somebody who's um, an entrepreneur thinking about uh, the application of new technologies. Why is it important for them to think about the future? Well, for, uh, it's really important for a lot of reasons. If you want to uh, be competitive, if you want to bring real innovation out to the marketplace, um, you know, it, everything is connected, right? It's both obvious and, and not, right? A lot of times we think about our innovations in isolation. Like if I just do this cool thing, you know, better mousetrap, well, you know, people will beat a path to my door. But in real life, everything is connected. And so it's important to think strategically about the future. Um, and, and you'll have a real advantage if you understand the context of your innovation, both how we got to this place, the history of it, and possible futures. Um, the, the, one of the reasons that we apply design thinking tools here is um, the very first thing you talk, Bill talked about in design thinking, it's, it's these are, are, are pro tricky problems without a lot of boundaries. And, um, and design thinking tools can be really helpful in that context. Um, and you know, if you want to build sustainable solutions that are around for a long time, not just for today, it's important to think about the context of, of your innovation. Um, and you know, the biggest problems are pretty complex. If you want to have real impact in the world, applying these kinds of tools to, to bring some boundaries to the problem, to think creatively about alternatives and not just build on the first hypothesis that pops into mind. Um, uh, uh, these, are, these are great tools for, for thinking that way. Um, and then lastly, this, this last bullet is kind of important. The future can have a range of possible outcomes, right? A lot of times we think about forecasting in the same way we think about prediction. And it's not about predicting the future because that's, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. And in fact, the actions that we take today can impact the future. Actions that we take tomorrow can impact the future. So there are a range of possibilities out there, um, not just one. And so if we're thinking strategically about um, how we wanna play in the future, how we wanna win in the future, how we wanna influence 
the future. It's important to understand that range of possible outcomes and that cone of uncertainty that, um, that I'll refer to again later. Um, and, and then you can decide where you want to play and where you can have a real advantage. Um, so let me just put a little bit of a framework out here that we'll talk through today. And I'll talk through an example as well. Um, a lot of times when we start uh, thinking about forecasting, um, we will pick, we will define a central question. And what I mean by that is like, what's the area that you want to be thinking about? Um, a lot of times we think about, oh, well, what's the world going to look like in 20 years? Which is an interesting question, but it's it's got so many variables that that it's it's hard to to wrap your head around, much less make some predictions about that can be useful. So um, we want to make this useful. We want to make this something that you can take away and take some action about. If you're thinking about, you know, 20 years from now, what's the world going to look like? That that that's hard to uh, that's an interesting conversation but it's not, um, not anything that you can really bring into today and take action on. So we want to focus on some boundaries about what is, you know, what is the question that we want answers to um, in this particular exercise. Um, the next thing that, that we spend a fair amount of time doing in class, and obviously we won't spend a lot of time today, but talking about the context of the space that you're looking at. Figuring out how we got here, um, and and doing some research, doing some background, and or bringing in experts who know the space that that you're playing in. It's important to understand the context so that one, you don't reinvent the wheel, um, which we see a, a lot of. Um, you know, people coming out with some great innovation. Turns out somebody already did that, and in fact, maybe they failed a few years ago, and you could have learned something if you had just understood what happened with them. Um, uh, so, so kind of getting, getting the lay of the land, um, then look around for what are the drivers of, of change in the space? What are the key elements that are going to drive change in the space that you're interested in and pulling out some insight into, you know, which, which ones are important, which ones are going to have the biggest impact? Where's the biggest uncertainty in the space going forward? Um, and, and pulling, you know, pull, extracting those out. So then you can think about what possible outcomes could there be? What, what are the different futures that could happen in my space? Um, which ones are most likely? And, and, and putting some structure around that can be helpful so that then you can think about your options and take action. Why do you care? How will you participate in these futures if the, the vast uh, range of possibility um, uh, if the range of possibility is vast, how will you manage that? How will you learn about the future? What should you be looking for between here and there to understand which of these possible futures is likely to emerge? So we have this structure that we use um, in the class that Bill referred to, um, ME297, Forecasting for Innovators. And you know, we'll take students through this week by week. And we work with, we work in teams. Um, and it's a great way to both explore a new area if students want to explore someplace new or to go deeper into an area of expertise. Um, so I'm going to take you through this process and we're going to use an example as well. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is about a central question, broadly defining the space with a grand aspirational vision. Um, and characteristics of a good central question are, are to make it interesting. Essentially, you're not hypothesizing a future, but you are thinking about what's a good question to ask that's going to stimulate thinking and thought provoking. It depends on this. It depends on that. Um, uh, it might be a hypothesis, but the point is to generate generate learning at, at this first stage. So we're going to talk about robotics for this example here today. Um, and a question that people might set, might ask would be, what does the future of robotics look like? Which is interesting, but that's kind of a researchy question and it's kind of boring. How about a question instead of, when will a human marry a robot? So, and I like that question because it, it makes you kind of stop and think for a minute. I like, what, what would that mean? What would that look like? And, and it could, could stimulate a fair amount of debate. Some people might think, well, that's pretty close in. Some folks might think, well, that'll never happen. 
Um, but what it does is, is it, it kind of gets you thinking about what the next questions are. Oh, and, and the next questions should be about context. Like, how did we get here? Um, understanding how things have changed in this space. Um, design tip and the design tools that we use typically solve problems for today and can be super useful about need finding, understanding users, um, understanding the issues. But in designing for tomorrow, some of these design tools allow us to understand the history of this space, the technology that is in place today, um, and the rate of change, which can be actually pretty, pretty important. When we think about innovation and technology, we're often optimistic that this is gonna this is gonna happen really fast. But you know, some of these questions about robotics that we're looking at here today in this example are the same questions we were asking 10 years ago and 10 years before that. Um, and so the rate of change is really important. Um, change around some of the technologies is, is pretty rapid. The rate of change around some of the cultural factors, some of the, the ways that we use robotics it can be much slower. And, and when you think about how those are connected or linked together, um, that's where you really under, start to understand what are the factors that could either accelerate or potentially impede adoption of this technology that we're working on. The other reason I look at context, don't reinvent the wheel. Oftentimes there's <laughs> some things out there that you may not have been aware of that you could build off of or leverage or learn from. So the next piece um, is where we're gonna spend a little bit more time here today. So thinking about driving forces and the drivers of change, we like to think about three types of, of driving forces. I'm gonna start at the bottom here instead of the top. Um, technology. Um, technology is where a lot of change happens and it can be quite rapid. Um, and that's where a lot of innovators kind of focus heavily on. Um, but we might also overlook some use cases uh, or culture. These are the things that, that that need to align to bring adoption or to adapt change um, over time. Um, and all of these things will feed into the, the innovation going forward. So um, let's start Let's start here talking about technology. Um, let's go back to the example that I brought up of a central question. When will a human marry a robot? So technology that needs to be in place for you know, imagine, imagine yourself out there in the future or one of your children or somebody coming to the place where they would consider marrying a robot. What are the scientific breakthroughs or the technological advances that, that need to have happened um, to make a machine functional as a human partner that somebody you'd wanna, wanna marry? So let's Bill, let, let's chat a little bit about about that here. What what are some of the technologies that you think might need to be in place to to, to marry a robot? Well, um, you probably want to have uh, certainly some kind of a you know a physical instance of the thing that it wasn't scary or weird. Um, you'd probably want to have something you could talk to. You know, we wouldn't have to type input or something like that. You could talk and have a sort of a normal conversation of some sort um and you know if you're thinking about a you know a life partner um versus just a robot that you know cooks and cleans or something then um i kind of i mean i kind of i'm, I'm kind of a hopeless romantic i want something with a little soul with a little bit of uniqueness something you know interesting or curious for me to learn about because I don't want I don't want a machine. Machine yeah. is predictable. I want something that's a little more, well, human. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are a bunch of technologies that we'd need to come together to even create something that we could start to think about partnering with over time, right? And some things, you know, as as straightforward as sensor technology. Like, can this thing make its way through the world? Does this thing recognize that I am its partner? Right, so vision technologies, communication technologies, speech, language, um, battery power. Like, does is my partner going to get plugged into the wall, or is my partner going to be out in the world with me? Um, mobility, 
things like you know some base some some basic building blocks of this thing that could that that I could partner with. So there's a lot of technology that would need to be in place here for sure. Um, so let's think about use cases then. So use cases, I, what I mean by use cases are these kind of intermediary products or services or functions that would need to come together to create a desirable life partner. So like, so Bill, you mentioned, you know, empathy, but um, you know, some kind of companionship, right? There's that's, or, or, um, you know, intimacy, right? That's a use case that would combine some of the technologies that one might expect in one's life partner. <laughs> um, you know, a, a household support service is another use case. Like, you know, picture the robot in, in the Jetsons, right? So wouldn't it be awesome if we all had that, that you know, the kind of characteristics of a household, household support person? Other other use cases. What do you think, Bill? Well, how might we use robots yeah, kind of in this interim yeah. period? Yeah. Well, you mentioned mobility. I mean, you know, I want to I want to travel with my partner. I want to get on an airplane and you know, go places. I want to, you know, I want to rent a car and I want them to be able to drive it, or maybe it'll be an autonomous car and they can just you know jack in and tell it where you want to go. But if you think about um, if you think about all the emotional aspects of companionship. Um, it gets pretty tricky to, you know, to think about creating a machine that has that kind of emotional depth. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. And so let's actually start, let's think also then about some of the cultural drivers of change, like that would, that would, what are some social or political or legal or <laughs> regulatory issues that might emerge? as we think about people marrying machines. So this is where things get really, you know, pretty, pretty tricky. Like, would it be well, legal sure. to marry a machine, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you think about the legal thing, I mean, we assume that when two people get married, they can give consent. I want to marry this person. I'm not being forced to do so. I want to marry this person. How can a machine give consent? We don't have, I mean, doesn't that require uh, Free will? Of consciousness or intelligence. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, you look at some cultures like Japan, where robotics has been adopted for, you know, elder care and other things, they might be more open to this. But I think in the US, um, people would be kind of freaked out if I was, you know, sitting at a nice restaurant having dinner with a robot. And why, why would that? And if the robot actually has, you know, free will, <laughs> to marry you as opposed to being your servant, um, yeah. if they don't have free will, like it, it starts to uh, open up all sorts of interesting, interesting kind of cultural, societal questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. One that can, can one a that robot, can can that. A robot what about, file for divorce? Yeah, would a robot file for divorce? Or what about procreation? Are you gonna have children with your robot? Whoa, what does your legacy look like? Will you even need a will because your robot might live forever and you obviously won't, you have a human body. So all sorts of interesting questions start to emerge around this kind of cultural side of, of, uh, you know, of this question. Whereas, you know, if you're just thinking about the technology side, you might think, yes, we could physically build a robot that you could marry, but, but wow, like, all, you know, what's the setting of, of this and the culture? Mm -hmm. So th I think this this is a great way to think about, um, you know, what are some of those underlying drivers of adoption or something that might impede adoption of robotics in general? So even though you know we're focused on this question of you know mar human marrying a robot, we're also eliciting all sorts of questions that are relevant. Even if I'm I'm not looking at marriage, but I want to understand the future of robotics in general, because all of these things will come into play as we as a society adopt, you know, more robotics into our world. Um, well, this, this, stuff, yeah. this stuff is coming up in, in like factories, right? Where robots are working side by side with human workers and mm -hmm. the human workers are unionized and the robots are not. And then there's all these debates of, and was it even safe to work next to a robot? Because the robot, you know, has no, 
you know, sense of, you know, the human being fragile. So it's really, I mean, I love this forcing question because although marrying a robot may be a little bit extreme, you can easily, you know, kind of down select to, to situations we're already in where robots are working. So Amazon wants to have all their factories full of robots, you know, but there's still people there. So how do we, how do we navigate these important, you know, like cultural and use case issues? Right, right. You know, there are also, I think, some great examples out there of, of places we've gotten stuck in this technology level right? Thinking that technology is going to drive change all on its own. You know, you and I were talking earlier about, um, uh, you know, the VR glasses, right? Google's doing these glasses. A Apple's done the glasses. Um, Snap has done these glasses. And it's this really cool technology, but nobody's adopted them. And, and, and I think it's because one, there haven't been real good use cases for them. There are some very niche use cases around, um, you know, kind of medical robotics and things like that, where that could be really relevant. But there aren't a lot of use cases, so people haven't started to use this and getting and gotten comfortable with them. And from a cultural perspective, we kind of, as a group of people, have not yet decided that walking around with, you know, with computers on our faces is comfortable or useful or or societally acceptable. Um, so no matter how great that technology might be, it's it's not it's it's not adapted. Well, and it's a perfect example also of looking backward in technology. People think, you know, Apple's Vision Pro, wow, it's brand new, or the Oculus that, you know, Meta's Meta's stuff is based on the Oculus headset. But you know, I had friends in the 80s who started a company called Face Space Face Space fake space labs, and they were doing VR with two CRTs, literally two, two televisions <laughs> on a balanced boom that you could put your face in and you could have the exact same experience you're having today. And all that's happened is the technology got faster, it got smaller, it got lighter. But still, you know, Not in enough. whatever that is, 50 years, nobody's come up with a reason that I want to do this VR or AR stuff and that that it would be acceptable in our culture to be wearing, you know, like I said, a computer on my face. <laughs> yeah. So we got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. So let's pop back to some methods here and, and um, think about what you do with, with these drivers, right? So there's lots of ways to think about generating this list of, of drivers of change. One is discussion like we're having. Another might be a, a tool like an idea map that we use a lot in, in design and design thinking. Bill, you want to take just a minute and talk about what, you know, how you might use this kind of tool? Sure. Idea maps, or sometimes they're called uh, mind maps, are just a great way of really, you know, loosely exploring an area and being um, very, uh, um, you know, using using your both your intuition and your sort of creative mind to kind of quickly map out all the ideas that are connected. So you have something idea in the center. In this case, it might be robotics and, and uh, autonomy or robotics and a robot that you can marry. And then off of that, you you brainstorm a few uh, options. And then off of that, you brainstorm options off of each of those. And as the mind map gets bigger and bigger, it brings in more and more of the different domains. And it's not limited to just the technology piece. You can have you know a whole, a whole part of the map might just be around the, um, the use cases. A whole part of the map might be around the cultural or social issues. I mean, it's just a great way of a team really fleshing out all of the connections and interconnections between uh, the central idea and lots and lots of other ideas. And it's a great way to get teams brainstorming together as well. Yeah, great. Um, and so here's an example in this uh, example that we've been talking about where a human marries a robot. So what we did was start you know, with an idea map and generating lots of these different elements. Now, I wouldn't expect anybody to to actually read all of the little tiny things on this on this screen, but I wanted to share this kind of as an overview in terms of like how you might use an idea map to start generating things, put them up on a wall, and then you can start to group them. And we used in this case, you know, the blue ones. We started thinking about what were the technologies and. The orange ones were, you know, what were some of the use cases and and you know applications of robotics, and the green ones were about society and culture. But then we started rearranging them on the wall because, uh, you know, the last thing you want to do in a brainstorming session is put a bunch of post-its on the wall and walk away, 
that's just a, that's that's it feels great in the moment and then you know immediately it becomes useless so in this case we started rearranging these and start thinking about what were the linkages what were the the how are they connected um, and what were some of the most important um, elements that we wanted to consider going forward as we were building a forecast in this space yeah. so you can see things were circled they had lots of arrows um, some things were underlined and the like and and so those were the things that we took forward because to try to build a map with you know with a hundred elements here it just doesn't make sense so you try and yeah. figure out which ones are the biggest impact and which ones have the greatest uncertainty so that and the top drivers have have both because the things that you know or can predict in you know fairly reasonable ways are going to be the underlying factors in in any future but if you're trying to understand the breadth of possible futures let's look at the ones that we think will have the biggest impact positively or negatively or speed wise um, and which ones have the greatest uncertainty because that's going to kind of give us the breadth of possibility in our in, you know in our count of uncertainty so um we uh, just uh, kind of skim quickly through this example we took the the items that were circled or squared on that map we started just kind of going through them in terms of impact and uncertainty so some of the things that we identified and and you as you look at these might think differently so this is a tool for conversation it's it's a you know qualitative tool obviously um, not quantitative and there's a lot of of room for discussion here so like which ones do you think would have the highest impact and highest uncertainty we picked empathy like how do you even create empathy from a technology perspective? Huge impact on whether this is gonna unfold, how it's gonna unfold, and a lot of uncertainty. Um, learning as well seemed, you know, seemed to be a, a high, high. Companionship, like we talked about earlier, um, in terms of a use case, uh, seemed pretty high impact. How do we do that? What does that look like? Timing, how could that unfold? And then interestingly, you know, a bunch of these things under culture um, legal marriage, so the, the legal elements around how we typically think about marriage. And somebody I see in the Q and A asked, like, "What is even marriage? Should we be talking about marriage in this space? Is it a as, what would a legal union look like as opposed to a legal kind of a human marriage? It might evolve to be something different or defined differently. Um, and this notion of free will uh, can you know can a robot can we can we build robots that have enough free will? And frankly, if they have free will, will they want to marry us? Right? <laughs> like, like, if I mean, that's a huge uncertainty and, 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 you know, and a huge impact on the answer to this question. So we, you know, because I'm, a, you know, I've, I'm a consultant and a lecturer and all, I like to put a little framework on things. And so for me, it's helpful to kind of graph those. So what are the things that have the highest impact and the highest uncertainty? And those are the elements that are most likely to tip the future one way or another. So those are things in the top right here, empathy, learning, companionship, the notion of legal marriage, free will, relationship, trust. Um, and when I do this, it really helps me to think of, to look at things graphically. And so it, it you know, when I look at the things in the bottom left, low uncertainty and low impact, it's not that they're not unimportant because they are critical, but, you know, creation of a physical body somehow, and even what does the sensors, development of sensors look like? Um, those are, are I, I wouldn't say predictable, but, but you can foresee a pretty clear future in development around sensor technology, right? Historically, they've gotten, you know, faster, smaller, more sensitive. So I think compared to some of these other things, that's a relatively straightforward, I would call that kind of part of the landscape going forward. I would assume sensors will continue to get smarter, smaller, you know, better. Um, language, I'm assuming that there's, that, that the language technologies will continue to, to, you know, get better, faster, more useful. Some of these other questions, empathy, I don't know what that's gonna look like, right? So, um, so oftentimes it's, it is the technology pieces that are in this more predictable part of the, the landscape and some of the cultural stuff that is the more uncertain, which I think is kind of interesting. 
particularly for somebody who is a technology person, it's like, oh yeah, there's all these other things. So the, well, how we would you know work with this next is thinking about kind of what order, how did how do these things relate to each other? Um, I grabbed the things from that top right, the high impact, high empathy, and kind of laid them out. I think we have to figure out empathy before I begin to trust a, a machine. I need to have trust in place before I could build an actual relationship with that machine. Um, there needs to have some sense of relationships and we need to figure out free will before we define what a legal marriage or a legal union could look like. So just kind of generally laying these things out and starting to think about how they connect, you know, what, what order they're in and then how they connect to each other, started layering in some of these other factors. Um, and, you know, we've got physical body, mobility, language, sensors in here that all need to get, get you know, dealt with pretty early before we can start to do these other things. Now, um, I want to step here for a second because and reference the, the workshop that, Bill, you're going to talk about at the end here. Um, as we look at the um, expertise of the Stanford professors in the engineering department, um, and the students that are working today in the you know, PhDs and the labs and the like, a lot of them are making huge advances in these technology areas and some of them in the, the kind of the use case areas as well. And so you know, going deep into these elements gives you a lot more information about how they connect to the other, the other elements. Um, and I just would encourage people as they're going deep into these spaces to think about kind of what either what are the technologies that underlie them and or what are the, the cultural factors that, that need to be in play for adoption? So after, after we kind of lay these things out, let's build some stories. Let's get to that, um, that cone of uncertainty. So you, know, you, can, you can lay these out and start thinking about the, you know, the top piece of this gets us to legal marriage. So Let's say the first things out there are, you know, robots around sex and intimacy. So I might say that some of those exist today, right? Household service bots. Um, you know, maybe the next thing is, uh, you know, is starting to build some relationships with these um, AI, you know, friends. Um, skin, motion, pain, replicated, fully mobile, humanoid, um, because most of, most of us, when we picture a human marrying a robot, it's a humanoid robot. You're not marrying a box, right? It's unlikely that you could have all of these things in place with, you know, with 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 a, a big metal box. Um, but then, what happens when you've got a fully mobile humanoid um, that maybe has free will? Well, maybe robots are going to start doing things independently because they have free will. They might want to be citizens. They might want to vote, right? <laughs> they might want to have choice, um, and probably at that point, that's the only point where I can imagine legal marriage kind of being redefined to include being married to some kind of artificial intelligence. And that's you know that's a a, a it's a reasonable story. It's a rational story, um, and it's an outcome that when you understand the elements of it, is not. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Flip side of that is when you start thinking about how some of those elements might turn out differently. Um, you know, in terms of, of some of the elements that we've talked about, realistic conversation has got to be in place. High capacity batteries have got to be in place. But what if we get to a place where that uncanny valley still remains and we're not able to build these humanoid robots that are that are good enough, so that we start to to kind of back away from the notion of of robots as human and start moving towards robots that are embedded in our environment, which is also a a, a, a future that could make a lot of sense, right? You walk into your home and you don't have a humanoid service robot. You just walk in your home and say, "Do my laundry, home." <laughs> it's just you know. Go, make this happen, world around me. Um, and so the robots are not humanoid at all. Maybe they're just embedded around us and, we, and, and, and they, they start to become of our world. And 
and so then kind of trust issues evolve a little bit differently. Um, and maybe they're so embedded in our world that we don't need people anymore in a lot of places. First grown adult with no other human contact. You know, there have been some sci-fi books and movies written with this future in mind. And it's, it's also plausible given what we just talked about. All of those elements, if they don't turn out one way, they might turn out a different way and combine in a wholly different way where we are here for the robots <laughs> as opposed to the robots being here for us. And so, you know, building out these stories gives us a sense of the, the range of possibility. Um, and you can, you know, you, you can look across these and see uh, see kind of a baseline future where robots are, are starting as service elements for us. Then we start to build relationships with them and then they find some kind of independence. And it's that, uh, that, that range of things around independence can be kind of scary, but you also can see how it starts much earlier to move towards one side or the other. So as we think about you know, the range of possibilities, why do we care? What can you do with this information? Right? Where does your company fit in? Um, are you working in a technology company that uh, will enable any future going forward? Which would be good to know. Um, are you working in a space that kind of will depend on one future or another? Um, you know, when we talk, when I talk with my students, a lot of them want to know. You know, I don't like that they'll come at this and say, I don't like this particular future. I don't want the world to come out where, you know, we are here for the robots. So what can I do today to influence the future? What can I do today if knowing that this is a possibility? Um, how can I think about influencing the future or playing along in the future or leveraging the future? Um, but knowing that this is the range of outcomes and that these are the things that are likely to unfold. Um, can give you a real leg up, no matter how you want to play in this particular space. So I'm going to wrap up there on the robotics and the forecasting, um, and yeah. see if any questions or Kevin, you want to add on that? I just want to. I'm going to jump in on a couple of things here because it's such an interesting idea. Um, there was a comment in the chat, chat about, oh, hey, they already have companion robots in Japan, and that's true. Nothing like what we're talking about, but it is one of the things I would put on. Mm -hmm. the chart they, they got little dogs that you know run around and bark they've got little companions but it's also interesting because um japan is going to be a super aging society in the next 10 years a va vast number of japanese are over 55 or 60. and in other parts of asia the the home care for you know for old for your older you know adults for your your parents um has been solved by importing uh, inexpensive you know, uh, caregivers from different parts of the world. I mean, I, I used to have an office in Hong Kong. Many people in Hong Kong have, um, you know, household helpers that they brought in from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from other places. And that's how they take care of their elders. Japan, because of cultural issues, has decided not to uh, do that. They don't, they don't bring, they, they don't allow that kind of immigration. And so instead, they've turned to robotics as a solution. But it's a really interesting sort of extreme case, right? Where the obvious solution is to go find some really compassionate caregiver to take care of grandma. And instead the Japanese for cultural reasons would prefer um, to offload that to a robot. And there was even a, a fun uh, movie made about this where the, 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 uh, there was a robot who was sort of, you know, helping a, an older guy age. And, and, um, and so, the, you know, the, the the cultural issue there is critical. And the other one that I, that you brought up, which I think is really interesting to think about, is trust. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I trust my bank with my financial information because they get hacked all the time. <laughs> I'm certainly not sure that I trust, you know, some of the big companies in Silicon Valley with my personal data, which they seem to like to sell all the time. And somebody's going to make and sell this robot. And I really want to know what that maker and you know, what the you know robots are us company that mm -hmm. sold me my opinion i really want to know what they're going to do with the data that's generated with with that because the probably the most personal data is the data about the person i love 
So, wow. I mean, it's just, I mean, again, it's an extreme question, but I think the extreme question brings out all these interesting combinations of, of you know, what's culture, what's technology, what's a use case. And that's the kind of stuff that I think really drives an interesting conversation about what's the next five years, the next 10 years going to look like. And at the rate of change that we're seeing right now with things like chat GPT-4 and, and other AI you know, implementations starting to flood into the marketplace, we're, we're at what we think is a point of incredible disruption. And that's why we put together um, this webinar to talk a little bit about forecasting, but also the, um, the program we're going to run in March for two and a half days live on the Stanford campus. Aren't you dying to get out of your office now that COVID is over <laughs> and finally go to a live thing <clears throat> where we're going to have amazing uh, researchers showing us what they're doing in robotics and autonomy and AI and other things so that we can build for your own organization these kinds of um, forecasting tools to get and you walk away with a forecast for the next five years for what you think is going to happen in your organization and particularly this idea of the cone of uncertainty what happens if everything goes great what happens if everything goes south i think that's that's exactly the kind of way we should be thinking about the future so i think um annette are you gonna can you cure it yeah <laughs> thank, well first <laughs> first and foremost thank you and cynthia for such a an a fascinating discussion i think a lot of folks were um very engaged uh so we will open it up to questions shortly if you haven't submitted yours please do so in the q a box if you have one um right on your console um now let's go into some questions the first <laughs> The first one we have here, what are the key drivers of change in our world today and how might they evolve in the coming years? Oof. That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> really, really big question. And, and I would suggest breaking it apart a little bit, right? No. Um, you know, you can see how putting some constraints around the initial question can allows you to go deep and then kind of surface back up to questions that are relevant. Like a lot of these questions that came up are relevant to society in general and understanding kind of how this world is going to evolve. But we didn't get there by starting like starting with that huge question, like how's the world going to change? It's a valid question for sure, but it's not a, not necessarily a useful way to get to answers, right? Yeah. So I would suggest coming up with some provocative question here. And I'll bet when we started this, uh, folks were going, yeah, yeah, pick a, pick a question and then go for it. But then when you do this, you realize that how a, a provocative question like that can really help you kind of go deep into an area and then come up with some answers that, that are more broad. Yeah, and just to add up, to build on that, I think the, 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 the value of asking a good question, for instance, if I'm a policymaker and I'm thinking about you know public policy uh, in the city of San Francisco for the next 10 years. Um, what are my, what are my drivers? Well, it's the economics of the, of the, of the region. It's, you know, um, that's certainly climate change and how that's going to impact, you know, uh, uh, the region both in for, for like, where is it going to be safe to live and how many seawalls am I going to have to build and blah, blah, blah. But when, but if I have a, if I have a focus or I have a point of view or a lens to look through, then I can figure out what the drivers are. To say what are the you know what are the mega drivers for the world for the next ten years, um, I'm not sure you can get any traction on that question because you end up with generalities like well economics and social unrest, and climate the problem, change, course, world climate peace, change and, you know yeah, yeah. those, those aren't you know, useful. Yeah, you, can't, you can't you can't solve the problem. So I think this is where diving into a particular focus and then fleshing out a cone of uncertainty could raise the next level of questions and then doing it again and again, you know, you'll end up with five or six of these kind of cones and forecasts. And then perhaps you could synthesize something down to say, well, you know, if, if, if I am the president of the United States, my number one priorities need to be X, Y, and Z. But even that is going to come through the lens of what's good for the U S rather than the world. So I think asking the right question is, is, is critical you know, to get to something that's that's actually actionable. Yeah, you know, and let me give you another example. So some other questions that we have posed in, in this class are, um, you know, we wanted to look at healthcare, for example, pretty big topic. And the question that we posed was, um, uh, will, 
will I, or will the students in the class um, live to be 120 years old? Will I live to be 120? So it's a somewhat provocative question. Um, it's pretty, it's fairly general, but specific to healthcare. So that really allowed us to dig into healthcare in an interesting way. And, you know, what are not just longevity technologies, but what's going on in, you know, biotech and social services and what else is going on in society that will kind of accelerate or impede longevity and these questions. And it got us to a lot of really interesting questions about, um, you know, about retirement and social policy, as well as, you know, technology behind, um, you know, the field of longevity and other healthcare issues. So by asking a, a, a question with some boundaries on it, um, in a provocative way, it really allows you to open up and, and go, deep, go deep and then open up. I love that. Um, thank you. I think the next one is a, is a great question around um, applicability of this methodology. And um, this, uh, this participant would like to know, what is the role of a design leader to apply forecasting into corporate strategy? Um, I, I love that question. Um, I think the role of a designer can be to both, you know, provoke and put some boundaries on stuff. Um, you know, I think good design often um, thrives with a little bit of constraint and kind of focusing on that central question, encouraging people to uh, put some constraints on their questions instead of, you know, what is the future of robotics? Like encouraging people to, to, to put some, you know, something down that we can all kind of discuss and rally around. Um, and then bringing some of these design tools into play, thinking about encouraging people to think about alternatives and alternative futures, um, encouraging people to think about the human side of these questions, not just the technology side. Um, I think a lot of design tools um, are part of this conversation and, and really can be. Great. Um, next question. Um, so let's see. What questions or frameworks do you use to assess where one's analysis might be wrong? Where one's analysis might be wrong. Um, um, let me take a, yeah, go ahead. Let me, I, let me take a whack at that and then you can follow up. Um, that's the, the whole idea of this is that we're using you know, brainstorming, mind mapping, design principles. Somebody said, can you use chat to come up with drivers? Sure, why not? I use chat in my classes all the time as a brainstorming tool. Chat doesn't know what it's talking about, but it's, it's good at, you know, randomly generating, you know, interesting work and interesting things to think about. But the whole idea of, you know, forecasting a cone of uncertainty is that there's no right or wrong. There's a probability that the future will be this. There's another probability that the future will be wildly different than that and a different probability that will be the negative of that. And so when you look at that, then you, and you think about your own organization, you know, like let's say you're in a, a, a pharmaceutical company and you're thinking about you know, drug, drug discovery and drug system, delivery systems for the future. And where's that gonna go? And how can AI influence you know, uh, speeding that up? Or you're an energy company and you're trying to think about transitioning to the green economy or you're a you know, tech company and you're, you've got some brand new thing that you wanna make an app you know, that has something to do with AI and, and um, you know, the uh, financial markets. So you take these tools and you start to think about, all right, what's going to change in the future? And how can my company respond to those changes? And what's the likelihood that the worst case is going to happen? And what's the likelihood that the best case is going to happen? So we're not talking about, you know, coming again, as Cynthia said in the beginning, we're not predicting the future. We're coming up with a range of possibilities and probabilities that the future can, you know, can sit inside what I love the phrase, the cone of uncertainty. And the, a nice part is, you know, you say you start with the forecast and you're so five years out and you've got your cone, blah, blah, blah. A year later, you're at a completely different point in that cone of uncertainty, right? And you can start all over again and go, so these are the things that actually happened. This is how my assumptions change. What's the new cone? So it becomes a dynamic tool for thinking about the future in a structured way. Without the without getting into you know I'm right or I'm wrong or I'm predicting or I'm not predicting. All right, I think that's great. Let's see if we can get in you know another question or two. <laughs> yeah, let's let, let's get into the next one. Um, 
The next one that I have here is, can AI be applied to leadership to a leadership framework in the future? Will AI become part of ex of executive of an executive team as well? What are your thoughts on that? Certainly <laughs> could be. <laughs> um, and I'd be, I'd, be glad I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if it if it doesn't somehow become part of the executive suite. How so? is a different question, right? So, um, you know, using a framework like this, I think it really help us kind of tease out what are those possibilities? Um, and then you, then, then you've got your own quest context for asking that question. Why, you know, why do you want to know that question? Because you're an executive and you want to figure that out or because you're a shareholder and you want to invest in more of that or less of that, or because you are a, an employee and you don't want to be, you know, led by an AI or you do want to be, you know, you think that's great. So the context really matters yeah. in, in kind of why you're asking that question on, you know, in terms of what you're going to do with that, with that information. But I got to tell you, I love that um, some of the questions here are, are being asked about kind of the, the framework and so many of them are being asked about the content here and, you know, and people have some really interesting <laughs> thoughts about you know, robots and robotics and the future of, of robotics, which I really love that, that this is stimulating those kinds of, that kind of thinking. And that's, yeah. that is really the, the value yeah. in, a, you know, kind of a framework like this to get, get you really lots, thinking lots about of, the hard questions. Questions. This is yeah. not, about it's not, yeah. a, you know, you can talk about it superficially. Oh, I heard this in the news. I saw that in the news, but to really understand it, you know, having a little bit of structure like this, look at all these awesome questions that have come up and, and the comments people are making about, you know, ethics and, and you know, the legal nature of robotics and AI and how that's evolved and all these other interesting things. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really loving the, the variety of questions. I wish we could share these all out. <laughs> yeah. One yeah, well, one of the, one thing about ahead, the, about the, every question has an embedded assumption in it. So will AI be part of the executive suite? Um, well, in my kind of uncertainty, AI replaces executives because if most of what executives do is try to make optimal decisions, AI will be better at it than they are. Now, if you're talking about leadership, that's a different thing. But this is going to force executives to separate what they do about decision making, which isn't leadership, it's just management versus leadership. And so, you know, to me, if you look at the, the, the changes that are coming, why would I pay an investment banker 2% of my, you know, of my fortune to invest for me when I can hire an AI that's going to outperform that, that human by 10%? Why would I pay a CEO millions of dollars to simply make decisions about the company when the AI will make better decisions? So I think, you know, in one version of this, there is no C-suite. Companies are run by AIs. And more efficiently, and with less, yeah. <laughs> with less, less humanity, right? Because they'll just make rational decisions. But boy, you know that that's a you know be careful of the question. The question has an embedded assumption that that the folks who are asking it will still exist when the answer occurs. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. I mean, I agree with somewhat. It's a very thought provoking conversation. I loved it. I hope you all um, on the line loved it as well. We are at time. Um, thank you, Bill and Cynthia, for this interesting, insightful conversation. Like I said, to everyone in the audience live with us today, thank you for all your questions and super engaging participation. I want to remind you that today's session was recorded and a link to this will be sent and made available to you all within a week. Have a great day and um, see you all next time. Thanks so much.